Hello and welcome to the Center for Climate Repair, a conversation between Sir David King and Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, presented by Cambridge in America. Our organization provides philanthropy and engagement opportunities for more than 19,000 University of Cambridge alumni across North America. Today, we have over 375 alumni and friends registered for this event, tuning in from around the world. Welcome again to those just joining us. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your camera and microphone will be turned off throughout. This session will have a Q&A following the presentation. You are welcome to submit Q&A questions throughout the talk using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Our speakers will attempt to address as many questions as possible, but time is limited. We thank you in advance for your understanding if your question is not answered. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded onto the Cambridge in America YouTube channel. And now I'd like to turn things over to Lord Alec Browers to introduce our speakers. Lord Browers is an alumnus of Gonville and Keys College and a fellow of Trinity College. He served as the master of Churchill College and head of the Department of Engineering and then in 1996 as the university's vice chancellor. After retiring as vice chancellor in 2003, he was appointed a crossbench life peer in the House of Lords, and for four years chaired the Select Committee for Science and Technology and is presently president of the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee. Please welcome Lord Alec Browers. Good morning, good afternoon, and good morning, everybody. It's a very great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Cambridge in America to this conversation between Sir David King and Dr. Sean Fitzgerald about the Center for Climate Repair. These are extraordinary times, but I hope you are all safe and well, and we are glad that so many of you have joined us today. The Center for Climate Repair is a cross-disciplinary research institution aiming to develop and understand the solutions that will safeguard our planet from the disastrous consequences of global warming. Located in Cambridge, the center works in affiliation with Cambridge Zero at the university. The founder, Sir David King, and Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, director of the CCRC, are here to discuss the center's commitments to restore our planet. Sir David King was master of Downing College and head of the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge, and is now Emeritus Professor of Chemistry. He is the founder and chair of the Center for Climate Repair, an affiliate partner of System IQ Limited and senior strategic advisor to the president of Rwanda. Sir David has played a remarkable role in bringing awareness of the dangers of climate change to world leaders and extensive background prior to starting this center. He was the UK government chief scientific advisor and the foreign secretary special representative on climate change. He's traveled widely to pursue, to persuade nations to take action on climate change. He initiated an in-depth risk analysis approach to climate change, working with the government of China and India in particular, and initiated a collaborative program now known as Mission Innovation to deliver technologies needed to complete the transition to a fossil free world economy. Sir David is a fellow of the Royal Society, an honorary fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and a foreign fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was knighted in 2003. Join, joining him is Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, the director of the Center of Climate Repair and a fellow of Girton College. Sean has worked at the interface of academic research, business, government policy, and public engagement, and has extensive international experience in the commercialization of new intellectual property arising from university research. He founded a successful company specializing in energy efficient buildings and supported the UK government in the rewriting of policy documents for building standards. Sean is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and prior to joining the CCRC, he was director of the Royal Institution 
overseeing the Institute's renowned program for engaging the public with science and engineering. We will now bring them both to screen. Please welcome Sir David King and Dr. Sean Fitzgerald. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Delighted uh, to be addressing you today on this critically important subject. What I'm going to do is just very quickly run through a bit of the science of climate change, where the current big challenges are, and then what we're doing to try to uh, deal with this enormous uh, challenge to our civilization. So first of all, let me start with just telling you a little bit about the science. By the time we reached the end of the uh, 20th century, 19th century really, but 20th century, <clears throat> we had really a full understanding of the nature of climate change. Uh, by 1820, we had the great French mathematician Fourier uh, showing that he could calculate the temperature of the earth, knowing the amount of energy arriving from the sun and the amount that was absorbed by the earth. And he found he had to use a parameter to describe how much of the energy absorbed from the sun was captured by the atmosphere. 1860, the Irish scientist Tyndall discovers it's not the whole atmosphere that captures that energy because oxygen and nitrogen cannot absorb any heat energy, any infrared radiation. And so what, what he discovers is that it's these minority gases, the so-called greenhouse gases that capture the energy and keep the earth about 30 degrees centigrade warmer than it would otherwise be, about 30 degrees centigrade warmer than the surface of the moon. And so, as we move forward, we go to 1898, when the first calculation is done by uh, the Swedish scientist, Svante Arrhenius. What, what uh, Arrhenius does is to simply sit down and say, what if the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere were increased by humans uh, using fossil fuels, which is a process that had obviously begun well before then. And he concluded that if we were to double the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the temperature rise would be of the order of four to five degrees centigrade. And today with all of the massive computers that are available and the much more detailed understanding of climate science, we know that the figure is more like three to four degrees centigrade if we were to double the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So now I have to switch over and say, where are we with uh, greenhouse gases today? Back in the pre-industrial level, I'm just going to give a few numbers now. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere were at about 265 parts per million. Mostly, the vast majority of it was straightforward uh, carbon dioxide. And as we arrive at today, the number is actually just over 500 parts per million, about 508 parts per million. If we add in, as we have to do, the other greenhouse gases that have been emitted as a result of human activity, and in particular methane, methane levels are now at quite a high point. Without methane, we're at 415 parts per million. Include methane, we're over 500. And so, where we are today is already at a point where we understand the temperature rise could well be three to four degrees centigrade, even if we were to emit no more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. A little point in paleoclimatology, if we go back four to seven million years ago, that's the last time we know that the planet was at a greenhouse gas level uh, similar to where we are today and temperatures then were about three to four degrees centigrade higher than today. But sea levels, and this is going to be a point I'm coming back to, were about uh, 25 feet higher than they are today, about uh, seven meters higher. So I now come to discussing the real challenge that was not understood properly 10 years ago. There were some voices uh, uh, that were saying, we've got to expect this. What is happening in the Arctic Circle region in particular? Let me dwell on this one topic and then I can get through in a brief period of time. So in the Arctic Circle region, we now know 
that the loss of the ice that was covering the Arctic Sea around the North Pole has now proceeded far more rapidly than any of the climate scientists predicted back uh, 10 to 15 years ago. There's a big positive feedback in that melting. And so, so today, during the Arctic summer, roughly 50% of the Arctic Sea is exposed to sunlight. Now, what does that mean? It quite simply means that the Arctic Circle region as a whole, that whole region of the planet, is now about 3.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. We're already at that point that we all said many years ago we should never reach, a region of the planet having reached 3.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. The overall average for the whole planet is now 1.1 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. So this region of the planet, much warmer than the rest, and the reason is very simple. That blue sea, the deep blue sea of the Arctic, is now absorbing sunlight very, very efficiently, 80 to 90%, whereas the ice covering it, of course, was reflecting the sunlight back into space. So the North Pole region is now a warm region in the Arctic Circle. And in fact, the Arctic Circle region, which normally has a rather circular vortex around it, keeping the cold air in that region, has now become quite seriously distorted and it's meandering. So what I show you there is a picture got from our Met office, just demonstrating that because the North Pole itself is now warmer than the surrounding region because of that Arctic Sea, what you see is that at this point in time, the coldest region of the planet was between Canada and the United States and certainly not the North Pole. So we've got a dramatic change in the weather systems of the Northern Hemisphere. This polar vortex is meandering. It's not stationary in that position, it's rotating around. And so we're seeing some very strange weather in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm sure you're aware more than we are of the very low temperatures experienced in Texas, minus 16, minus 12 in two periods about uh, four years apart, three or four years apart. And that has never been experienced by human beings in Texas before. On the right hand side is a problem that I will come back to, which is the possibility of methane emitted from the Arctic Circle region. The permafrost, which is the state of the earth in the northern regions of Russia and Canada, the permafrost contains methane in the form of a molecule, methane hydrate, which decomposes. It loses the water that it's attached to, decomposes at a temperature below the melting point of ice. And so if you walk on the permafrost now and throw a match onto it, you can see a lovely blue flame spreading over the permafrost region. That's methane escaping from the region very low density, doesn't stay lit for long. And on the left-hand side, here's the biggest risk of all at the moment, which is that sitting there in the Arctic Sea, now during the polar summer, exposed to that blue sea is Greenland. And Greenland has enough ice that if all of it melts, global, global sea levels will rise by about seven and a half meters by about 25 feet. 23 to 25 feet. So what, what we see is already happening in Greenland is the loss of that ice faster than was originally predicted. So there's a positive feedback. Let me just very quickly say, when, you, when the ice melts in Greenland, that's such a big ice sheet that it starts forming lakes. And as the lakes get deeper, the color gets bluer reflecting the, the sky. And so it absorbs more and more sunlight as it melts. So there's the big risk that sea levels globally will now rise far more rapidly than we'd previously anticipated. If I could take the next slide, I'll just say something about methane emissions in the permafrost region. I was at the Arctic Circle meeting in 2019 when the Russian Academy had sent a group of scientists to the meeting to report on explosions taking place in uh, the Yamal region of northern Russia. And these are pictures of the craters left after the explosion. You'll see on the left-hand side, 
there's, there's basically a crater with not much material around it because most of that, you, it looks like there's a lot of earth, it's not earth, it's basically ice and methane. And what is happening is a, a methane bubble is forming below the ice. And when the pressure on the bubble created by the gravitational force above it exceeds the mass and gravitational force, it blows all the remaining ice out and all of it uh, enters the atmosphere as water vapor and methane. Now, of course, uh, and the right-hand side actually shows the academicians who were sent to investigate the first uh, release in this way. You see a, a team of them standing on the other side of the crater, and on this side you see the shadow of the photographer on the other side of the crater. How many of these have formed so far? About 1,000. Uh, and that is rising. It was 1,000 by 2018. It certainly has risen since then. Is there enough methane being emitted to actually distort the greenhouse gas level in the atmosphere? Not yet. The danger is that these uh, explosive releases of methane will increase, and then there is enough methane in the Arctic Circle region to raise temperatures by 25 degrees centigrade. I mean, this, this would be end game, but let's not worry too much about that because frankly, I don't think that's our biggest worry at the moment. The biggest worry is the melting of ice on Greenland. If I could have the next slide. <clears throat> Here's an example of this. If we look at the impact of rising sea levels and the warming of the ocean surface, uh, we see that the region of the world that is going to be most impacted is in, by rising sea levels is in Southeast Asia. All of the countries in the Southeast Asia region will be impacted. I'm just showing you here Vietnam. And on the left-hand side is the prediction for the annual flooding of Vietnam uh, uh, by 2050, just 30 years from now. The left-hand side is the prediction made 10 years ago. The right-hand side is a much more recent prediction by the same group. And what you'll see that is that Vietnam, which is very close to sea level, essentially it's that Mekong Delta pushing that land out, so it's all very close to sea level. Uh, the the uh, vast majority of the land mass of Vietnam, underwater at least once a year. The reason is not only because they have rising sea levels, but of course storms at sea, and in particular, the hurricanes that happen in this region frequently cause the sea to be roughened and therefore incursion takes place further. But worse than that, the hurricanes are picking up energy from the thermal energy of the sea after a hurricane has passed over the ocean, the ocean is far cooler in that region. It's picking up the thermal energy into the vortex of the hurricane. And essentially, uh, we therefore see that warming seas due to climate change makes this impact worse in this region. And they have now experienced the worst hurricanes ever recorded in, by human beings over the last few years, uh, particularly in, uh, in uh, uh, countries like uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. And so what, what we see is that a, a vast landmass, and this landmass here, Mekong Delta, the biggest rice paddy fields in the world, is a big rice producer for the region. But together, couple that with Indonesia lying very close to sea level, archipelago, uh, we know that uh, Jakarta, for example, will be underwater to such an extent within a fairly short period of time from now that it won't be livable. That's a city with 30 million people. You might have seen the pictures of Jakarta flooded in January and February this year, literally underwater. What, what we see is that this bustling modern city built out of the rising GDP of that country over the last 20, 25 years will not be livable by mid-century because of frequent flooding. If I look around the major areas, Vietnam, the whole country unlivable. If we look at uh, Calcutta, the first major city that will be unlivable due to frequent flooding. And on the other side of, the, uh, of India, 
Mumbai as well, very close to sea level and very much subject to flooding as sea levels rise. So there's the nature of the big challenge ahead. 200 to 300 million is the estimated number of people in this part of the world, and I'm including Bangladesh, two thirds of which will probably be unlivable by mid-century. 200 to 300 million people in this part of the world will not be able to live where they are currently living. So we're looking at a major issue of climate refugees. But in addition to that, the loss of rice in the region is going to be enormous. If we look at Southeast China, that is also a region at risk from frequent flooding and rice paddy fields again at risk in that region. So, so what we see is the, the nature of the challenge going forward in time. And what we're doing in setting up the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge is setting up a center which will act as a research center. We will also do development of new uh, technologies, new projects, but we are also acting as a global hub for actions around the world, working with major universities where we can work on particular projects such as the University of Hawaii, the University of Incheon, the Marine Institute in, in Goa, uh, but also working with uh, Stanford University in the United States, working with Tsinghua in China and so on. We are, we are working as a hub on climate repair to see that we can extend these activities around the world. Let me take the next slide, which sets out the, the objectives of the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge. These, I know, sound very grand and very ambitious. I'm going to say they're neither grand nor ambitious, they're simply necessary. Deep and rapid emissions reduction, we're cooked without that. Cre create new greenhouse gas sinks, and our objective is to restore the atmosphere from 500 parts per million to about 350 or less. That will take us, even if we roll out our technologies very quickly, we, even if we do that, it'll take us to the end of the century to reach it if we get item number one delivered. Item number three, in the meantime, the, the poles are unfreezing and we need to deal with that. So we are looking at refreezing the poles. And I know that attracts a lot of wry smiles from people. Uh, I can explain how we're beginning to approach that problem. Then, of course, we need to promote agile political investment responses. And, and we are working on both the political and the financial sectors around the world as we, as we move forward in time. If I could have the, the next slide just to go through very quickly, the focus of feasibility for our projects is first of all, technological feasibility, that's research lab work. Secondly, scalability. We're only looking at CO2 removal from the atmosphere if it's possible with that technique to see that we could remove at least a billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. And we obviously need to factor into this the cost of doing this. And then thirdly, we're looking at potential adverse impacts. We don't want to be uh, clobbering the earth in some other way, but that's through these adverse impacts that might, uh, might occur. And then on the next slide, I'm just picking my favorite uh, for greenhouse gas removal. Everyone has a favorite. And this is ocean surface iron fertilization. We like to imitate natural processes, and this is doing exactly that. When the wind blows over the Sahara Desert and picks up a dust storm from the small dust particles in the sand, and then, for example, over the Sahara, blows over the Atlantic and the wind stops blowing and drops the dust onto the surface of the ocean, held there by the surface tension of the ocean, Within a month, that area is green. Typically, the area would be 50,000 square kilometers in extent. And that green area contains a vast amount of phytoplankton. And before you know what, you've got a massive fish stock. I mean, billions of fish in one of these areas. The reason is the ocean is teeming with fish eggs. Each female fish on average lays 100,000 eggs. 
And so what, what you have happening is larvae hatch, most of them die, but in these green areas, they all survive. And so you get billions of fish, they attract the bigger fish from elsewhere. And so you have a massive harvest of fish there. We deposition takes place as calcium carbonate and I, we are still to do the experiments to see how much of it does this. And that in that way, carbon dioxide captured by the green material is firmly sequestered. Next slide is showing you an intervention with cloud brightening. And, and this is simply saying that as we move forward in time, we will need to create white cloud, bright clouds over the North Pole during the polar uh, summer to reflect the sunlight away from the sheet of ice that has formed over the ice during the previous winter. And if we do that year on year, we'd probably have to do it for 40 years. The idea is that we create layer upon layer of ice and that gives us some comfort going forward in time as we bring greenhouse gas levels down uh, to a decent level. So there you are. I've run through the nature of the challenge, the strategy that we're developing, and we are working on these projects right now. If I could take you to the end of my talk and just say thank you for listening. I look forward to the questions. So Dave, thank you so much indeed. Um, so this is Sean Fitzgerald, Director of the Centre for Climate Repair. It is always so uh, inspiring hearing you, Dave, talk about the magnitude of the problem, but in equal measure, also the enthusiasm and vision that we have at the centre for actually doing something about it. And it is, and it's, uh, it's something that we can tackle, but time is not on our side. Uh, and it really is a case of we need to start deploying these sorts of uh, very large actions that you have uh, laid out and others besides within the next few years. There is experimentation that needs to be done, but actually we need to get on with it. So um, I'm going to invite the audience uh, to uh, please do submit questions uh, through the Q&A function. Um, and then we will be able to take as many of those that we have time for um, over the course of say the next 30 minutes. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the first um, uh, uh, question, Dave, uh, from Kumkum Bhavnani, um, and it says, good morning. Uh, so clearly uh, so gives you an indication as to where they might be. Uh, how are you working on social justice issues in relation to climate repair? And how is social justice woven into your work on climate repair? So the first and quick answer is that we have in excess of 40 uh, senior professors across the university who have uh, joined us as associates and these people include social scientists uh, and these include people who are working on exactly this area. We are very very concerned to see that we do all of our work in a way that is seen to be socially just. We need to see that all people's benefit and we also by the way are, I'm committed to the ecosystems. We need to manage our ecosystems going forward in time, as well as the well-being of human beings. So we, and by the way, I think it's also fair to say in other universities, we're working very closely with people on this, but we also have set up operations with NGOs. Uh, for example, WWF is uh, an NGO that we're working very closely with. Sean, you may have another answer to that. Well, I was going to uh, be say even more about the social justice issues. I mean, clearly there are social justice issues um, on many, many facets of life, uh, science and engineering and lots more besides. Um, and in fact, the, the challenge of tackling with climate repair is actually an important, uh, an important lever for us to actually address some of these social ills which have been far too long uh, just put to, not given the prominence that they should be. And given that this is so important now, Dave, um, and in my view is that we need to weave this in very, very strongly and use this as an opportunity to actually create a better society for all. And that, clearly that's a very deep rooted um, part of the, for example, the negotiations at COP and things like this. But it is, I do, I do believe that this is something that we should be taking on as a positive, as something that we should be doing 
in addition to, for example, the ecosystems um, uh, arguments that you've just laid out, Dave. We have a next question, which is, uh, this is a technical one, Dave, um, from Richard uh, Cacaccio. In all the discussions of greenhouse gases, I never hear any mention of the heat released by combustion of fossil fuels. How is this taken into consideration? And is the potential for change understated by not considering this? Uh, well, to, if, if, if I answer the question in the following way, the, the big cities of the world have become heat islands. And, and the reason is because of the escape of heat from buildings, uh, particularly, of course, in the winter. And so temperatures in our cities tend to be higher than temperatures in the surrounding areas. But fortunately, however big our cities are, they don't really square up to a big change in the global climate system because they're a very small part of the total surface area of the planet. 72% of the planet is the ocean surfaces. Uh, and of course, on the land surface, uh, the, the fraction of the surface occupied by cities is relatively low. So the real answer to the question is that the escape of heat from buildings is important, but it's important down in the tenths of a degree and nothing like half a degree or one degree. Very good. So we now have another one, uh, Dave. This is uh, regarding our your your pet project uh, for greenhouse gas removal. It's from Noriaki Kinoshita, uh, and the question is this: Would ocean surface fertilisation require government interventions, or could it be a private sector-led initiative? Yeah, that's a very important question. And when we do our work, we want to see that we have global recognition of it. We want to make sure that we have global permission to do any of these experiments. So if, if I answer in terms of ocean iron fertilization, there is a body that looks after the oceans of the world, a, a, a UN-based body. Uh, and the uh, body that deals with anything like ocean iron fertilization, strangely enough, is the London Protocol on dumping at sea. And so if we were to dump, for example, uh, desert sand on the sea, we, we could be charged under the London Protocol Agreement. Um, th there is a real issue. For example, the United States is not a member of the London Protocol, so countries could choose to, to opt out of these. But what we would like to see, and I would certainly like to see, is a full protocol developed under the United Nations on all of these technologies. So, for example, uh, any country could put aerosols up into the stratosphere to try and reflect sunlight away from the earth to cool the earth down. And I believe there should be a moratorium against that, but we should allow experiments in that area. It may be that we will have to resort to that, but I, I would rather that we stayed with, as I said, uh, mimicking nature, biomimicry. Very good, Dave. Right, the next question. Uh, two people have asked something very similar, so I'm going to do both at the same time, from Gwen uh, Kinkeed and Tom Moss Gamblin. Um, how fast do you now see the Greenland ice sheet melting, Dave? Okay, there's an awful lot of ice there, and it's been accumulating over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so it's, it's likely that the full melting of the Greenland ice sheet may take 500 years. Um, however, however, by the end of the century, perhaps sea level rise, just the Greenland ice sheet melting could be two meters, could be three meters. Right? So the initial melting can happen quicker than the bulk melting that will take place. But I, I do think we need to remember the age of our civilization. So when we say, well, if it's a few hundred years, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, I would really argue strongly against that. Uh, I think we, we only have to visit places like Greece to see the remains of the old civilization that produced ours. Very good, Dave. Right, well, we have to therefore follow that with um, a question from Donald Porteous, whom we know well, Dave. 
Uh, so very nice to have you with, with us, Donald. Um, interesting to hear East Asia is set to be one of the most affected areas related to what we've just been discussing. Is there realization from there about the scope of the issue and support of the solutions? Yes, so I, I can tell you that the ASEAN countries put out a, a bid to help them to prepare for their future, for their future development was the idea. They came to Cambridge and I do know the group that won the bid, know them very well. And they have already put in their uh, operations. And this does include the analysis that I've just given you. Uh, the country of Indonesia has already started the process of moving their capital to high ground. So uh, the, the answer is they are aware of it, but not to the extent that they need to be. So the awareness is only just beginning to, to get into government levels. And certainly that's not true of all countries in the region. Right. So we have um, uh, another question regarding sort of not the science, Dave, but the, uh, the, the initiatives behind this from Les Canat. Um, a carbon fee charged to producers and dividend that's distributed to all taxpayers approach to limiting the release of carbon dioxide is being promoted in the United States, uh, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act of 2021. How do you rate this approach to rapid reduction in atmospheric carbon dioxide when compared to other approaches, Dave? Right. So I am working with a group uh, in a, a British-based bank. Uh, it's Rothschild's bank. And uh, what, what we've, they've worked up is a scheme where we, we change the cap and trade to a system where instead of charging on products that have used fossil fuels in, in their manufacture, you charge the price on the coal, oil and gas companies producing uh, mining and producing the material that is subsequently burnt. In that way, you are pushing those companies, let's take the oil companies, for example, into a direction of finding alternative means of developing their own business model. I, I just say this because what we would do is set different prices moving forward in time. So if today it's $100 a, a, a ton of carbon dioxide effective production, we move it up to $200 in five years time, announcing in advance the increased rate. I think this is a, likely to be the most effective measure if we can get the leading government, governments of the world to follow this. I think it would take the 25 leading economies of the world, including China and India, to back this idea in order for it to catch on. Great. So, um, Dave, I, we have another question. Um, let me just find, my, my screen is moving here. Um, here we go. Um, um, from Joe Finney-Jones, what is the cost of these initiatives? No, oh, so the, the, the cost of each initiative is going to be very, very different. If, if I take the, the cost of ocean iron fertilization, it's almost certainly negative in the sense that if, if we create additional fish stocks, which I'm pretty confident we would do, we're of course going to try to see that there's a mechanism for charging for uh, the, the fishing rights to, to take more fish out of the sea. It only has to be a small level of charge because the Ocean Iron Fertilization Project has this very attractive feature that it's quite inexpensive. Iron is inexpensive. Uh, I think desert sand is quite inexpensive. So it, it is a, a relatively profit making process. If I go to the other, and many of the systems that we're looking at would be profit making. Uh, but of course, if I go to the other extreme, we're not going to make a profit out of uh, refreezing the Arctic. That is a risk management exercise. And we would need countries to support that. The answer, Joe, is 
many, many different answers, but it's all far, far cheaper than the risk of just letting it run. Great. So Dave, we have another question and uh, I might take a stab at this one. It's from David Ginger. Um, it says, can you discuss scientific technical risks versus social acceptance treaty liability risks to various geoengineering solutions? So, um, so the, the term geoengineering um, is now, I think, more widely um, applied to the, the techniques that are used to basically alter the solar radiation, solar radiation management. There was a time when it also included uh, greenhouse gas removal, but I'm gonna focus uh, to answer this question uh, in the area of solar radiation management. And um, David, you're completely right to raise this because uh, there are this whole area of um, playing with, uh, with solar radiation is fraught with uh, lots of challenges and we can't undo history. So there have been uh, some, some, uh, some experiments and actually even in the media just in the last two weeks where uh, one particular technique called stratospheric aerosol injection, which is where um, small particles um, of sulfur dioxide, so you can use titanium uh, as well, are injected into the stratosphere um, and they, the idea is that that will then provide a global cooling effect. And, um, and the other thing is that the time scale over which that the, the, those particles then remain in the atmosphere, or it can be a couple of years. And there is a body of um, sort of thought really that says that this is, um, this is A, the science isn't known, and B, if you do an experiment even just an experiment on some of these sorts of effects, the timescales over which you are looking at are very long. And there needs to be, in, my, in our view, um, a, a concerted effort at discussing with the people who are most going to be affected by um, some of these approaches, for example, those in the Arctic region. Because if you can actually uh, engage with those people to help them curate the solutions as to what is it that they would actually like to see, and that it's not just about climate change for them. This is to do with other issues. So the question earlier about social justice, this is to do with their, their own livelihoods and their own uh, patterns of life. Are there more local effects, that techniques that you might look to introduce. And that's, for example, one of the ones that David suggested, marine cloud brightening, might actually be more expensive than, for example, stratospheric aerosol injection in terms of the global effect. But it might be something that's more acceptable because it may, may be able to be deployed more locally. And certainly the timescales over which you would then uh, look to have it turned off if for some reason the experiment showed that this was not going to work. You're not locking into a multi-year problem, you're only locking into maybe two, two, two weeks at most. So there are very significant um, uh, issues to do with engagement, public engagement, and looking with stakeholders on different types of geoengineering techniques. And that's part of the research and engagement that we're undertaking at the Centre for Climate Repair. David, did you want to add anything to that or not? Okay, fine. Right, um, we're going to uh, move on to a question by Rick McCose. Even if we stopped all emissions right now without any further intervention, how long would it take for the climate system to settle back to what is an optimum level for humanity? And, and what's the point of thermal runaway? Ah, Rick. Let's deal with the first question first. All right, we're now talking to an ex-PhD student of mine <laughs> who I haven't seen for decades. Uh, so a, a very, very important question. Um, so first of all, the, the inertia in the global climate system is a major problem. Uh, if, if we just look at the global warming that has already happened, if we were to stop greenhouse gas levels where they are now, the estimate is that it, the temperature rise would still roll forward, temperature changes, all of these things, the climate changes would still happen over the next 20 to 30 years. That's the level of time that uh, is, is inertial in the climate system. It takes time for the earth to catch up with this, this warming process, for the oceans to catch up, etc. cetera. Um, if we now reverse this, how long would it take? I think the, the answer, is an equal period of time. 
So I, I think the, the business of getting greenhouse gas levels down to 350 parts per million will probably take us to the end of the century. Is that fast enough? It's not fast enough for me, no. But I don't think we could get it faster, but I'd love to be proved wrong. It may be that we have a, a range of techniques like ocean iron fertilization that could operate quicker than that, in which case let's get there quicker. To have a comfortable period into the future for perhaps nine and a half billion people on the surface of the planet is an enormous ask. And what is also required therefore is probably a very big change in our economic system, our economic approach. I'm going to say that if we continue with uh, uh, rampant consumerism, which doesn't produce any improvement in human well-being, we are probably not going to manage it. So I think the, the answer to your question, Rikma, is let's talk privately. <laughs> it's a very long answer that I've got in my head. Great. So um, I've got a question from Gary Metcalf, which I'll probably take, Dave, is um, are there strategies focus specifically on methane. So yes, there are. Uh, and this is one of the research projects that we are kicking off at the Center for Climate Repair. It involves actually converting, firstly, methane to something rather less, uh, less troubling. So the problem with methane, um, as Dave mentioned, it's got a higher global warming potential. So for every molecule of, of methane, it's rather worse uh, than carbon dioxide. It's about 80. 80 times worse over a 100 year time scale. So we are looking at um, developing an approach which will convert the methane to carbon dioxide. So although we're converting it from one green greenhouse gas to another, um, it actually means the logistics are much, much easier. You don't have a, a sequestration issue. In other words, handling of your product, just getting it out into the atmosphere and it has a significant potential in reducing the warming effect. And we're doing, uh, we're working up a project at the moment with Siemens Energy, with Arup, um, and looking at using photocatalysis. And there are other techniques available as well. You can create it into other products, but this one is about uh, basically uh, using deserts and things like this with barren land to be able to undertake this. Um, Dave, we've, we're almost running out of time. I'm going to um, take a question. I think it's from a very dear friend of mine uh, from, from uh, who I last saw probably about 15 years ago, Jonathan Fong. Um, it is wonderful to hear of this work at Cambridge. Can you say a bit about the size of the Centre for Climate Repair, number of faculty, students, et cetera, and perhaps how it compares to similar efforts at other US and UK universities? So Dave, I was gonna ask you to take this one. Uh, so I mentioned the 40 plus associates <coughs> who we're working with around the university. I also mentioned that we're a hub and I don't believe there's another climate repair hub in the world at the moment. Um, what, what we have is a site in Downing College, uh, and Downing College has wonderful uh, conference and workshop facilities. So we would plan to hold conferences and workshops around the, the clock through the year, uh, bringing together the, the people who are committed to action uh, along the lines that we're spelling out here. Um, the, the model for this, is a well-developed model at Cambridge, which is the Isaac Newton Center for Mathematics. And mathematicians around the world meet here in Cambridge and discuss issues of great importance to them. Um, we, we are happy to work with uh, universities around the world and that expands our capability. What you need to know is that we're in a, a fundraising mode. We are uh, currently uh, a team of about five full-time people and we are stretched, we are enormously stretched and we need to expand the core team as we move forward in time. And we are now in a position, due to donations we've received fairly recently, to be expanding our team quite rapidly over the next uh, few months. But uh, the, the team needs to grow very much more quickly and as a hub, we, we will have researchers who will bring new areas of research into Cambridge University to interact with other people in the university. So we are already in the process now, in the luxurious process 
of calling for a new fellowship in climate repair at Downing College, and this person will teach in an appropriate department of the university. Great. Right. Um, well, Dave, um, that, that is very, very good indeed. Um, I'm going to just hand over in one moment, but I'm going to uh, not answer a question, but because someone else is going to answer it for us. Uh, the, the question was from Paul Shepherd, and it was very simple. Bravo. What can we do to help? So uh, to offer some closing thoughts, I would like to welcome Jamie Arnell. Jamie is an honours graduate in law from Downing College and a qualified barrister. Jamie is a partner at Charterhouse in London and has previously acted as a consultant at a top management consulting firm. Actually, that's where Jamie and I first met. We were, we were partners together uh, in, this, uh, in this particular endeavour. Jamie is a champion for the centre and is heavily engaged with helping us to develop our strategy. Thank you, Jamie, for joining us. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sir David and Sean, um, for your concluding thoughts um, and for inviting me to close the event for you. Um, I wanted to explain briefly why, why I think the, the, the work of the Centre for Climate Repair is really so important and why I decided to provide some support. Um, I've been really fortunate in my day job, my career, but working in private equity, obviously I'm always chasing returns on investments. But as I've done that over the years, I've just become increasingly aware that um, however well I invest, um, I may be leaving plenty of money to my children, but I'm at risk of seeing them uh, left a planet that, you know, is, as David has pointed out, um, all but in, uninhabitable. Um, the world at the moment seems to be very focused on emissions reduction. And, and as David and Sean have said, that forms part of what the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge is, is working on. But for me, that, that has always felt a bit too much like managing to the model, um, in particular, the model of the IPCC. And it's necessary, but it doesn't feel like it's sufficient. And I'm sure there are plenty of people uh, uh, watching today who have followed models and seen how often they go wrong. Certainly that's my experience. Um, they do go wrong. And when they do go wrong, they quite often go very wrong indeed. And it felt to me that the, the world's pretty poorly prepared for that eventuality. Um, and as David has so worryingly pointed out, there are signs already that the model may be quite badly wrong. So when I saw that Sir David, Sean and others at Cambridge were developing levers um, that you could pull that could have a really significant impact in drawing down carbon quickly, um, in protecting some of those vital components of, of, uh, of the climate system, it, it felt to me that, that was an essential insurance premium. That, that these levers need to be developed need to be developed they also need to be very carefully researched before they're used and i worry a little bit that we could end up in a situation where the research hasn't been done and we find ourselves obliged to pull these levers in a hurry to try and fix a runaway problem and i don't think i don't want us to be there so for me supporting the center was an easy choice it sits alongside in my case other more immediate projects that you can sort of touch and feel in terms of afforestation and some uh, projects to, to help the recovery of kelp off the coast of the south coast of England and so on. So there's other things that I, I do uh, which, which are perhaps short-term fixes, but I really think that this, this initiative is, is a critical one to be behind if we're going to keep pace with what is, you know, a very, very uh, rapidly evolving problem. And as a benefit alongside that, it's absolutely fascinating. As you, you can imagine, and you've heard from David and Sean, you know, the level of expertise and the level of, of, uh, of um, interest uh, that, that these projects can offer those who support them it is huge. So for me, it was an easy choice. If you are interested in learning more about the Centre for Climate Repair, the, the, the link to the website will be circulated after the event concludes. And with that, um, on behalf of Cambridge in America, thanks all of you for joining us today and for being vital members 
of our Cambridge community. Um, I'm sure Cambridge in America, and we look forward to continuing to connect with you, probably for now in a digital capacity, and hope to see you at some future events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir David. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Lord Brothers, as well. And, uh, and thank you to Cambridge in America. Thank you all for, for joining.